Trinity, one God whose teaching is life, whose presence is sure, and whose love is endless. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins to the one who welcomes us with an open heart. God, our comforter, like lost sheep, we have gone astray. We gaze upon abundance and see scarcity. We turn our faces away from injustice and oppression. We exploit the earth with our apathy and greed. Free us from our sin, gracious God. Listen when we call out to you for help. Lead us by your love to love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. By the gift of grace in Christ Jesus, God makes you righteous. Receive with glad hearts the forgiveness of all your sins. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Almighty God, gracious Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit renews the church in every age. Pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep them steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort them in times of trial. Defend them against all enemies of the gospel, and bestow on the church your saving peace through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Also, a special thank you to Connie, who is not only using a clicker to get the PowerPoint going, but also going back and forth as she sings and does the video and all of the things. Thank you, Connie. Not perfectly well right now. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. A reading from Jeremiah, the 31st chapter. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. I will not be like, it will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke. Though I was their husband, says the Lord, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another, or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and remember their sin no more. The word of the Lord. We will read uh, Psalm 46 responsively. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be moved, and though the mountains shake in the depths of the sea. Through its waters rage, and though its waters rage and foam, and though the mountains tremble with its tumult. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be shaken. God shall help it at the break of day. The nations rage and the kingdoms shake. God speaks and the earth melts away. The Lord of hosts is, is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come now, regard the works of the Lord, what desolations God has brought upon the earth. Behold the one that makes war to cease in all the world, who breaks the bow, bow and shatters the spear and burns the shields with fire. Be still then 
and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Now I'm going to read from Romans, the third chapter. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth shall be silenced, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, they are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous, and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes a boasting? It is excluded. By what law? By that of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from the works prescribed by the law. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand as you are comfortable to the reading of the gospel. Our gospel today comes from John chapter 8. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the Jewish people who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham, and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Well, today is Reformation Day. Of course, today is also Halloween Day, and you'll be celebrating that this evening with trick-or-treaters. But uh, this morning, this morning, let's celebrate Reformation Day because 504 years ago, on October the 31st, 1517, Martin Luther posted a big piece of paper with his 95 theses, his 95 discussion points printed on it, and he posted it on the church door at Wittenberg, Germany, because Luther wanted a discussion to get started. He wanted to talk about what the church was teaching in his day, how the church was behaving and how should they teach and how should they behave. And so he posted those discussion points. And of course, as you know, uh, Luther got more than a discussion started. He got a revolution started. He got a reformation of the whole Christian church in Western Europe at that time. And Luther uh, wrote lots of things, had lots of key teachings that some of us have uh, absorbed over the years in catechism class and in Sunday school. But really, there's, there's two central points to Lutheran theology. These are not things that Martin Luther cooked up by himself. These is what he, he rediscovered in reading the Bible, the uh, Hebrew scriptures and the New Testament scriptures. There are two central points. The first central teaching is that Uh, God loves each one of us fully and freely, not on the basis of who we are or what we have done or what we accomplished, but out of God's own uh, free and abundant and generous spirit, God comes to embrace us. Before we're even born, the Old Testament prophet says, God says, I saw you in your mother's womb and I loved you and I gave gifts to you and I gave a calling to you. The first central teaching 
of Lutheran theology is that God loves us abundantly and freely out of God's own grace. And the second, the second central teaching is that God not only gives love to us, God gives purpose, God gives meaning. In Lutheran language, that's called a vocation or a calling. God sends us into the world and calls us to use our gifts to the glory of God and in the service of people around us as we've received love to take that love to others in all the things that we do in our life. And so that's what we celebrate today. Now, for Martin Luther in the 1500s, for him to say that God loves each person freely and equally and that God gives meaning and purpose to each person, that was a real switch because that's not the way society operated in the 1500s. And that's not what the church particularly taught in the 1500s. In the 1500s, um, people primarily thought that only really good people, only really religious people, popes and priests and nuns and monks, those are the people who were good enough for God to love totally. And secondly, in terms of who was important, in the 1500s it was felt that only the people at the top, the top political and social and wealthy people, the, the kings and the generals and the wealthy merchants, those were people who really had a purpose in the world, a calling, and everybody else was just kind of slogging through life. But Luther said, you know, if you read the Bible, that's not how you see God operate in the Bible. When you read the New Testament, that's not how you see Jesus calling people and caring for people and loving for people. He says, if you read the Bible, you see that God is saying to people from the very first breath you take, I have loved you, I have loved you completely. For God so loved the world, for God so loved the world. And God says to us, I love you and I also give you purpose. And that's, that's the truth. As Jesus said in the gospel, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. A few years back, I read a story, an account, a true story about uh, a young merchant marine sailor who was on a ship in the Indian Ocean who got swept overboard in a storm and no one, no one noticed it for another couple days and they couldn't find him at that point. He had a few planks of wood that was floating nearby that had been tied together, so that kept him afloat. And he was able to get a little bit of drinking water from the rain that fell that he kind of cupped in his hand or cupped in his hat. But for 22 days, he was adrift. For 22 days, he was out there on the ocean, uh, no food, just a little bit of water. And at the end of 22 days, his health was really deteriorating. Fortunately, just at that point, a, a fisher boat of Pakistani fishermen were going along and spotted him and rescued him and took him to shore and got him checked into a hospital. And the next day, when he was in the hospital, a newspaper reporter for the Associated Press heard about him and went and interviewed him. And the newspaper person said to him, how did you survive? 22 days, how did you survive? And the sailor said, you know, each day I would try it for hours on end. I would think about, I would picture being at my parents' home in Denver, Colorado we were all sitting around the table, my parents, my grandparents, my two sisters, my three brothers, we were all sitting around the table. And my mother had cooked for me my favorite meal, spaghetti and meatballs. And for dessert afterwards, there was apple pie and ice cream. And I would dream about this and I would think about this and I could just, I could just taste the food and I could just sense their presence. And I'm convinced that's what kept me alive to know that I was being fed and cared for in that way. And then the newspaper reporter asked him, well, once you're discharged from the hospital, what are you gonna do? And the sailor says, I'm going straight home. And my mom has promised to fix me spaghetti and meatballs when I get there. I think that as we come to church here again on Reformation Sunday, every time we come to church, every time we come, particularly when we come and gather around the table that Jesus sets for us, Jesus is really saying, the primary message that Jesus is saying to us is, is welcome home, welcome home. You are my dear one, you are my beloved. Welcome home, there's always a place for you at the table. There's a place for you at the table and I fill you with the meal that is the, that is the bread of life. So welcome home because this is how special you are to me. 
I think about that sailor story because I think in a lot of ways we are adrift in the world and we need to know where our life comes from. We need to know what's the vision, what's the truth that sets us free, what keeps us alive. And I think in our world today, uh, we too are drifting through a very difficult time in the world today. We come here wondering how we're going to make it through. And so Jesus also comes to us and says, I'm with you. I care about you. Right now, we've been drifting along from day to day. We've been traveling through the pandemic for almost two years now. We wonder, we, there are ups and downs. We wonder what's going to come with all that. We live in a time where there just still is ongoing uh, political competition, competition and even uh, social violence. And we look at the world and see the serious condition that it's in. And in a place like that, we can feel like we're all on our own and we're adrift and we're heading into the future and we don't know what the future is. And we might be asking ourselves, how am I going to make it through this? And maybe the question even comes to us, well, where is God in all this? And does, does God love me enough to step in and make a difference in my life? Does God care about me? One of Martin Luther's uh, famous sayings was, God is with us and for us. God is with us and for us. It's hard to, it's hard to know in the world how to, we're going to make it through if we feel completely alone. But one of Martin Luther's phrases, God is with us and for, and for us. We're not alone. God cares about us. God is part of our life. From the very first breath that we took, said Luther, God breathed the Holy Spirit into us. God breathed the breath of life into us. And each day we are God's beloved. God is with us and God is for us. And that frees us. When we're caught up in our fears, when we're wondering about the future and what's going to happen to us, like all of us do at some point, when we're caught up in those fears, we're mostly thinking about ourselves and we're thinking that it's all up to us and we're going to have to somehow survive on our own. But to know that God is with us and God is for us and Jesus is welcoming us to the table and welcoming us home, that frees us from just thinking about ourselves. It frees us to use our gifts in the world to care for others. I remember a, uh, a true story, another true story told by a Lutheran pastor who was from Seattle at the time. And it was about um, a woman who was a member of one of the Lutheran churches, who still is a member of one of the Lutheran churches in Seattle. And she also was a violinist in the Seattle Symphony. And one day, uh, she received, her uncle came to her house and brought a gift to her. It was, a, it was in the shape of a violin case. And totally unexpectedly, she opened up the violin case. And inside was a, a rare 18th century violin that, that was at the quality level of a Stradivarius. It wasn't a Stradivarius, but it was at that level. And she remembers that when she opened up that violin case and saw the violin, she said it was a thing of such beauty and such worth that at first, in the first moment, she didn't even think she should touch it. She didn't even think she should take it out of the case and start to play it because it was such a valuable and beautiful thing. But in the very next moment, she realized if you're going to get a gift that beautiful, if you're going to get a, a music instrument that can play music of such beauty, of course you have to play it. Of course you have to take it out of the case. And so she did, she took it out and she began playing it to everyone's delight around her. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free, said Jesus. The truth is that you have received a gift, an unexpected gift from God. And the first gift is that you have received yourself. You are that gift. You are a gift to the world. You are a person of exquisite beauty. You are a person of wonderful gifts and your life is to be offered. Your life is to be played in the world. And so that is what we celebrate today, that we have this gift of ourselves as a beloved child of God. But then we also have other particular gifts that we can use in the world to serve one another. And that comes back to Martin Luther's uh, second sexual teaching. The first is that we're loved by God infinitely and forever. But the second is God gives us a calling. It's not just the people in the news that are famous that have a calling and that, have, that are going to make a difference in the world. Each one of us has been given gifts by God. <clears throat> For some of us, we've been given the gift of uh, 
a good mind to think things and learn things or to, or to teach people. Some of us are called to teaching. Some of us are called to, to writing. Some of us are called with the skills to be in medical work and to care for people. Some of us are called uh, to cook good food. Some of us are called with hands that can make things and build things. We each have our own particular gifts. We often look at ourselves and feel unimportant, or we look at ourselves and judge ourselves as not being good enough. But the real message that comes to us today, the truth that sets us free, is that God loves us and cares for us. Now, here's the last thing I'm gonna say to you this morning, is, and it comes again from that image of uh, a musical instrument, that we have been given the gift of life, which is like a musical instrument. And what that means is that um, we all know people who play music know that it doesn't just come automatically. You have to practice it. If you're going to learn to play the violin, you have to practice it. If you're going to learn to play the piano, you have to practice playing. And with the gifts that God gives us, we have to practice using those gifts. We have to put them to use, including the gifts of, of love and of peace and of hope. We live in a world today, I'm gonna to, to mention it again, that just has many major problems facing it and life seems to be so unsettled. And so we think to ourselves, well, there's not enough love in the world. There's not enough peace in the world. There's not enough hope in the world. How can I manage the hope? Hope and love and peace are both gifts that come to us, stirred up by the Holy Spirit. But they're also something that we have to practice. Uh, Hope and love and peace are gifts, but they are also something we choose to do by practicing them. And so if you look around you in your life and you say, there's just not enough peace in the world today, well, practice being a peacemaker. If you look around and say, people just aren't kind enough to each other, well, that's, a, that's God calling you to practice kindness in all kinds of ways throughout the day. To see you say, there's not enough hope in the world, well, practice hope in your own life by looking for the places where God is at work in your life or in other people's life. Practice hope by keeping your eyes open for God, for how God is moving through the world. We are those exquisite musical instruments that God gives to the world and God calls us to use them. You are my beloved, says Jesus. You are my dear ones. And we all struggle with, with moments in which we experience our brokenness, our failures. But God says, you know, I not only give you life, but I give you life again and again each moment. And you live by my forgiveness and grace. But know that you have gifts. Know that you have been given life. You have my complete love. And so now go out into the world, not thinking just about yourself, but bringing my life to others and bringing my hope to others and bringing blessings to others and bringing food to others and bringing education to others and whatever you need, God says, I want fullness of life for you. Be that in the world. You shall know the truth and the truth will make you free, that you are my loved ones and you bring my life and my gifts to the world. In Jesus name, amen.
present and future with the saints, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Set free from sin and death and nourished by the word of truth, we join in prayer for all of God's creation. We pray for all who long for a word of truth and for the radical grace that flows from the cross. Inspire congregations to freely and boldly proclaim your love for all people with persistence and hope. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We pray for your creation, for mountains, rivers, streams, cities, homesteads, and neighborhoods. Write in our hearts a new love and care for creation. Give us the will to curb wasteful habits and to hold accountable those who neglect the vulnerable. Hear us, O oh God. Your, Your mercy is great. We pray for all who aspire to public office and for all who will vote on Tuesday at local polling places and by mail. Pour wisdom and understanding upon all who govern so that the communities of justice and peace may thrive. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We pray for all who long for healing in mind, body, or spirit. Strengthen hospitals, clinics, counseling centers, nursing homes, and recovery centers to be holy spaces of renewal that all might live the abundant life you intend. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We pray for all who seek to grow in faith and love of you. Guide teaching and learning and confirmation, small groups, Sunday school, youth groups, schools, seminaries, and universities. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy, Your mercy is great. At this time, we invite the congregation, the people gathered through technology, and here in this space, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to lift up our own prayers, petitions, and thanksgivings to our Lord. We'll begin with Margaret, who will share our prayer list, and we'll open it up for all. Holy and gracious God, we pray for all the men and women who are um, incarcerated this day. Uh, we think especially about Walter and pray for him and all the years that he has spent in this place. We pray, Lord God, we give thanks to them for teaching us the song, I am who you say I am. They talk about freedom, they long for freedom. We pray for their freedom. We also pray this day for Dutch and Carol Fries, Janice Graham, Earl and Roxanne Grosser, Don and Jim Phelps, Judy Vick, Patty Wisney, Monica McFadden and El Corby, Kathy McCurdy and Don Patrick. Tom Tracewell, Dick Abdo, Zach Feely, Aaron Mace, and John and Sharon Hauser. And fold all these your people into your arms of grace, we pray. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. At this time, I invite all of you, for what do the people of God pray for today?
process, we need that reminder that they are loved by God, that they are gifts, that they are exquisitely beautifully made. We lift them up to you. Hear us, O oh God. Amen. 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 We give thanks for all the saints and reformers who have gone before us, who dwell in your holy habitation. Give us courage through their example to challenge unjust systems and work towards life-giving reformation. Hear us, O oh God. Your, your mercy is great. great. Confident that you hear us, O oh God, we boldly place our prayers into your hands through Jesus Christ, our truth and life. Amen. Amen.
abundance. You cause streams to break forth in the desert, and manna to rain from the heavens. Accept the gifts you have first given us. Unite them with the offering of our lives to nourish the world you love so dearly. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembering his love for us on the way, at the table, and to the end, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We pray for the gift of your spirit. In our gathering, within this meal, among your people throughout the world, blessing, praise, and thanks to you, holy God, through Christ Jesus, by your Spirit, in your church, without end. Amen. Amen. We pray together the prayer our Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. On this Reformation Sunday, we commune together. And so I'll give you a moment to open your elements that you should have received as you came in. Beloved, this is the body of Christ given for you. Amen. This is the blood of Christ shed for you.
salvation, send us forth into the world with shouts of joy, bearing witness to the abundance of your love in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace and peace and love. People of God, you are Christ's body, bringing new life to a suffering world. The Holy Trinity, one God, bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen. We join together in our closing hymn, which, if you've been a Lutheran for more than a year, you have probably heard before. <laughs> A mighty fortress is our God.
go in, the main entrance, drive around to the right, go all the way around the building, and then the first car will stop in front of the building. Do we want to be our first car? I, whoever wants, does anybody want to be the first car? Who? Dwight. Dwight will be our leader. Oh, perfect. Dwight is our leader. And then, um, and then when everyone is over there and we're ready to go, we'll circle twice and go out the front entrance again. But anyway, it's a way to uh, just remember um, the folks that came in. Does he know this is for Junior Tyler? Yeah, Tyler. <laughs> Tyler is tired already. A few other quick announcements. We will be uh, doing our Zoom Bible study. We're starting a new uh, theme for our Monday nights. and. It's all about welcome, and so we'll be looking at different scriptures, stories of stories of welcome, of acceptance, and I hope you will join us 7 p.m. tomorrow night on Zoom. Tuesday morning is quilting at 9, our lectionary Bible study at 1, and the CKCO board meeting at 5. Thursday, we have choir and worship team, and Friday, chair exercises. And we don't have any birthdays or anniversaries this week. None. No. That is just crazy to me. <laughs> um, also, uh, we, as Margaret mentioned, that the song that we sang after Bishop Jake's sermon today was actually introduced to us by the Livingstone Prison Congregation. And they are doing a raffle right now for uh, to help their fundraising for the year because the members of their congregation are inmates and they are not able, obviously, to provide an offering. And so, uh, if that is something that is of interest to you, please chat with Darlene. Also, next week is All Saints Sunday, so we'll be celebrating and remembering all of those saints who have come before us, and Connie has an addition to add. So, out there, there are these little cutout pink yellow, green, no, uh, blue and purple, like, they look like little cut out candles, little votive candles. Um, there is a little space on the front for you to write the name of somebody you would like to honor for All Saints Day. We're going to do a display on this wall instead of the lighting of the candles up here this time. So please do put the name of anyone ever that you have loved and lost. Um, at any point connected to the congregation or not. Just anyone that you would honor um, with a candle being lit, we will do something like that up here and it will stay up for a while. So just take a candle if you need extra. I can get some more. If you would like uh, a picture of that person to also be part of that, if you would email that to the church, um, we will make sure that that is included in the display as well. For next Sunday. So for next get Sunday. on that this week. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, as we move into November, which is insane, I still think, uh, we are looking at starting to plan Advent, which is coming up in just a few weeks, if you can believe it. And so if you have any ideas for different worship opportunities or something that you'd like to see for the music and worship team to be thinking about for Advent planning, please chat with me or Connie or Lori or Zach or Margaret. And if there's no other announcements, I invite you one last time this morning to stand as you are comfortable. Go in peace. The living word dwells in you. Thanks be to God.
everybody.